Nice size audience. Really great topic that we're talking to. I'm Andy Lowry, Chief Product Officer of a company called Epris, which is a high technology company that specializes in directed energy weapon systems. Today, I'm playing your YouTube advertisement that I guess you can't click skip ad on, so. <laughs> Very briefly though, good afternoon and thank you for joining us at the Contemporary Military Forum titled Army 2030, Preparing Today for Tomorrow's Fight. I'm Andy Lowry, Chief Product Officer at EPRIS, a high growth technology company based out of Los Angeles. EPRIS is one of AUSA's star sponsors and very proud to be part of this pro professional development forum. EPRIS designs and builds cutting edge high-powered microwave systems for counter-electronic effects, power management solutions, and applications across the government and both government and commercial sectors. In just three years, we've introduced three form factors or breakthrough Leonidas suite of HPM products. Today and during this show, we're proud to and excited to be unveiling the Stryker Leonidas, the newest member of our Leonidas family alongside our colleagues from General Dynamics. So stop by 253 to learn more about our capability sets and how our cutting edge technology can support your mission applications. Okay, so with that said, now skip ad, we appreciate the Army Associ Association of the U.S. Army and all it does for the Army, the total Army, educating, informing, and connecting as we see right here at AUSA's annual meeting. Thank you all for being part of this pro uh, program. We're very proud at EPRIS to be part of AUSA. If you're not a member, I highly, highly encourage. It's probably the best of all of the services uh, um, affiliated uh, uh, associations. So I really, really uh, enjoy our membership and encourage all of you to do the same. Thank you for being part of the program. Now I'll turn the floor over to General David Perkins, a AUSA senior fellow. General Perkins, without further ado. Well, again, on behalf of uh, General Brown and all the leadership here at AUSA, we appreciate your support in coming out here, and it's a distinct honor today uh, to be part of this panel, and we'll shortly get into introductions, but uh, I have also a distinct honor uh, to introduce our opening speaker, uh, a great soldier, a great leader, uh, and a fantastic chief of staff of the Army. There's been a lot of rocks in his rucksack lately, and uh, as there are always in the Army's rucksack, and then what happens is the rocks start coalescing together and becoming boulders. Uh, but the chief has really dealt with them all in a way that I think is a great example of leadership, poise, grace, uh, courage under fire, DC kind of fire, and has uh, really put the Army on a new footing for the future that we're gonna talk about here shortly. So again, a great leader, a great soldier, and a great friend of mine, General McConville, Chief of Staff of the United States Army. Hey, 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 thanks. Thanks to General Dave Perkins. And uh, those who know him, he's, he's a great combat leader, but he's also the one that I would say is most responsible for multi-domain operations and the concepts before it became really cool, you know? So how about a hand for Dave Perkins, okay? And, yeah, I, I just want to make some, some opening comments, and uh, then we're going to turn over some, some really smart folks that are going to talk about the Army of 2030. And the Army of 2030 is really important, because we should never forget what our Army exists for. Our Army exists to protect the nation, to fight and win the nation's wars as part of a joint force. And we do a lot of other things. You know, we help with COVID, we respond to disasters, um, we... we, we, we guard the, the southwest border, you know, we even drive buses, but we should never forget about what we exist to do. And we are an inflection point right now. We're coming out of, uh, you know, 20 years of irregular warfare, counter, in, counter uh, terrorism, counterinsurgency, and we recognize and we see what's going on around the world that we need to be able to fight large-scale combat operations in a multi-domain op multi operations uh, environment where we're contested in every single domain. And it's not about fighting the last fight better. It's about winning the next fight. And winning it so decisively, or being able to win it so des decisively, that no one wants us to fight us. And we've been here before, I look in the, in the front row, 
with General Maddox that is sitting there, and, and he and, and, and his peers were the architects of the Army that we all enjoy right now. They looked at, you know, coming out of 1973, our Israeli war. They learned a lot of lessons from that, and out of that, they built Air Land Battle. They built the Big Five. They built our national training centers. They brought all these things in that made us the Army we are today. But we are in a transformation. Every 40 years, I, I argue, the Army has to transform, and this is part of the path to that transformation. We're learning right now uh, in validating a, a lot of the concepts from what's going on in, in Ukraine. And so we're changing our doctrine, and it's coming, FM 3.0 is coming out, that's multi-domain operations. We're building new organizations, multi-domain task forces. We stood up an Arctic uh, division. Uh, the SFABs are out there doing their thing. We're getting out for information operations. We're taking advantage of technology when it comes uh, to how we're gonna train our troops. And we're certainly not walking away from our DIRT uh, training centers. They're just gonna get a lot harder and a lot tougher, and you, you will be contested in every single domain while we're there. And we're modernizing the Army. Six modernization priorities, they haven't changed. Uh, we're gonna deliver 24 of those signature systems by next year and, thir and, and, and 34 of those systems by 30. And then it's all about talent management uh, and, and we're doing a lot of things in talent management because with all the technology, it's, it's still about people. And it, it's all about people, it's about soldiers. And so I'm really excited about where the Army's going. I'm excited about what you're all doing to, to make sure that we remain the the greatest army uh, in the world and can defeat anybody. And I look forward to this panel and I just want to turn it back to you all. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Chief. Well, thanks, Chief. Um, you know, this is, as, as the Chief said, a uh, historic time in the Army. Every year is a part of the great Army history, but we are at, as the Chief said, that inflection point that occurs every 40 to 50 years. As a lot of us came in the Army, we were just coming along with uh, air land battle and uh, the Big Five, and, and that really has been with us 50 years now. And so now, as we are looking towards the future, the Army has put out a new operating concept, and then the panel will talk about uh, the new doctrine being put out, and then all of the capability that will come from it. And Chief talked about the 24 systems that are coming. And these, this, this doctrine, these systems will probably be with us in some form or fashion for the next 40 to 50 years. And so as the Chief said, the Army is transforming the way it conducts war, but at the risk of being uh, parochial, and I'm not going to be overly parochial, I'll just be adequately parochial. This is AUSA. Uh, this is not just the way the Army is going to refight wars of the future, because as goes the Army, really so does go our nation's defense because of how wars unfold. The, the, our ability to oppose our will on the enemy eventually takes place on the ground. In the United States Army, while we have great technology and we have great things, we don't fight technology, we, we fight formations. Armies have always fought formations. We don't fight an individual weapon system. And since we fight a formation, that formation is by nature joint. It is multi-domain. So as the chief said, we were multi-domain before multi-domain was a bumper sticker. And so when the United States Army comes up with a new concept, a new doctrine and new technology on a new way to fight formations, it is driving the way the United States of America's military fights its joint formation. That's just the way it occurs. And so that makes today's panel, I think, all the more uh, important as we look toward the future. And we have exactly the right folks here to lay this out for us. Uh, starting on my left, we have uh, Deputy Undersecretary of the Army Diaz. Secretary Diaz has been charged uh, with the Secretary for pulling this off, so no big pressure. Uh, I would say uh, we are very lucky that all our panel are accomplished operators in their own right, combat veterans, and so, sir, great to have you on the panel. Uh, the next member of the panel is the newest four-star in the United States Army, 
uh, General Jim Rainey. He's sort of wearing two hats, I guess. He initially was put on the panel when he was a G3, and now he commands future command, so he should get twice as many questions as everybody else. So, Jim, great to have you on here. And again, the next one down the line is our newest three-star general, I'm told, in the United States Army, Lieutenant General Beagle, uh, Combined Arms Center Commander. Uh, so he's sort of Mr. Dot Mill PF from the Army, Leader Development, Doctrine. We're going to talk about Doctrine here. So he's the one trying to pull all this together at the, at the, at the operator level in the Army. And then to cap it off, we have another great friend of mine, a warrior, Jim Greer from the School of Advanced Military Studies, SAMS, the home of our Jedi Knights, the big thinkers, the folks that come up with all these operational and strategic plans. So we have the, everybody from the person that's charged to the secretary to make it happen, uh, to the key general offices that are gonna synchronize it around the Army, to the guy that's gonna teach all our smart folks on how to operate it. So I can't have a better background than that. So again, thanks for being here. And I think, Mr. Secretary, we're gonna start off with you. I think we're going to sit and do this so it's a little bit more informal but first I'd like to acknowledge not only the Chief of Staff of the Army but uh, General Perkins and your participation on this panel uh, really as we were getting ready to talk about this uh, having General Perkins be part of the dialogue and sitting with us and just reminding us where we've been it's been so important uh, to watch you as a as an officer uh, and and being able to learn from you not only in Iraq and other places, sir, it's just an honor to be on the panel with you. I also have to say it's an honor to be here with uh, General Jim Rainey. Over the past year, I've been the Deputy Undersecretary for right out of year, and over the past year, I've been able to work with General Rainey as the G3, and I look forward to working with him in his, in his next role. And I'll save uh, the last two uh, on the panel over here to really say what an honor it is, because uh, Beegs, Milford Beagle is uh, Sam's classmate of mine. We were in Sam's seminar number one. Uh, that had uh, a few folks that did okay in the Army, uh, Major General Bob Whittle, Major General Charlie Costanza, Major General Scott Jackson, Lieutenant General Beagle, and I'm the other guy that was in that seminar. So seminar one did okay. <laughs> and uh, our SAMS instructor was uh, James Greer. So it uh, is kind of a full circle for uh, me on the panel today and, and glad to be here. I want to start off a little bit by talking uh, and focusing on what the Secretary spoke a little bit about today, which was why we need the Army of 2030. And some of the characteristics of that force. I'm going to first touch on a few ob objectives that uh, the Secretary highlighted early on in her tenure, then speak to five specific ways that the Army will need to be prepared to fight in the Indo-PACOM uh, AOR if called upon and then end with a quick assessment of our national defense strategy on how the Army fits into that and what the expectations are. So the Secretary uh, is very laser focused on the Army of 2030, as you heard this morning. If you didn't get an opportunity to, it's hard to follow that up with the clarity and the detail that she provided. But she has six objectives, and some of you may be familiar with those six objectives. I'm only going to highlight a few because they are important when we talk about the Army of 2030. The first one is putting the Army on a strategically sustainable path. And that's both a fiscal and a cognitive mindset and construct that we have to uh, maintain that path. It takes us not only from the, where we're at now to the Army of 2030, but as General Rayleigh um, has, has been charged to do, it will take us from the Army of 2030 to the Army of 2040. And we have to do that on a strategically sustainable path, aware of what the budget uh, allocations are, and more importantly, how we make change over time. The second thing I want to highlight is the Army being data-centric. The Secretary spoke a little bit about that today. And we always think about data centricity in terms of warfighting capacity, and that's critically important, especially in a contested environment. But we also need to have our data centricity leading our business and analytical systems. And as all of you know that are involved uh, in industry and in, in helping us get the right army of 2030, if we don't have the analytics correct and the data centricity focus on, on those analytics, 
we're going to be astray on, in some of our paths and some of the ways that we move towards that army. And lastly, about strategically adapting the way we recruit and retain our forces. Gets a lot of attention with recruiting and retention, uh, and very much so, and we could talk a little bit about that in the question and answer period, but it's not only about the Army of 2030 needing the right equipment, it's about needing the right people and delivering them uh, in the right formations. And I know that uh, we're going to talk a little bit more on that. What does the Army need to be able to do if we are called upon to fight in the Indo-PACOM AOR? Well, first, the Army will play a key role in any potential conflict, and it will be the linchpin force. It will establish, build up, secure, and then make sure that we're protected as we do so. We need to be able to sustain the force, and we're continuing with our theater uh, army in the Pacific and our theater logistics capability. We're building out a joint logistics type of capability, and that's critically important as we look at not only access and basing, but also pre-positioning of stocks. The Army must be able to provide the command and control at multiple echelons. Our planning and synchronization headquarters are second to none, and we'll be able to provide at scale a joint task force headquarters, both in the core or divisions, to be able to do so. And that's what the Army brings to the fight wherever we go. We also need to be able to pr provide ground-based long-range fires that comes in the form of hypersonics, mid-range, and precision strike. And we're continuing on, and in, over the next couple of years, we'll field all those uh, capabilities. And if required, the Army must be prepared to counterattack with substantial maneuver forces in the form of brigade combat teams, combat aviation brigades, to restore territory uh, that was taken uh, in terms of any type of hostile act. So we're seeing that not only in Europe, but we need to be prepared to do so in the Indo-PACOM AOR. Why is that important? Because the strategy of the national defense, uh, the, the words of the national defense strategy tell us that we need to be able to do so. And every day we're measuring ourselves against that strategy. We focus on not only our ability to provide uh, capability for integrated deterrence, but to build enduring advantage. And then we also need to accelerate our force development. What we also contribute significantly as part of a national defense strategy is campaigning. And the capability to campaign in the Indo-PACOM AOR is critically important. And it's not just about SFABs or it's not about multi-domain task forces, which are critically important, but it's about a sustained experimentation, exercise, and forward presence. And we are doing that, and we're going to continue to improve in that to make sure that as part of the national defense strategy, we are providing the capabilities we need to campaign effectively. And the Army of 2030 will be a campaigning army in Indo-PACOM. I want to leave on a, a couple of points and make sure that as we transition to talk more about what the Army of 2030 will look like and how the doctrine will drive that Army of 2030, I think it's important to remember that the Indo-PACOM AOR is not an air and sea or maritime AOR. It's a joint AOR. And as General Perkins said, it's about joint forces and providing those joint capable forces that the Army is critical to in the future. We also need to remember that the joint warfighting concept, the Army has a critical role in providing lessons learned and ensuring that we are able to provide the, the aspects of what's necessary for a concept of contested logistics. If we don't do so, nobody else will. And it's the Army that has to lead the way in that, in that aspect. So in closing, as we look forward to making sure that the force that the Army provides is what our nation provide, or is required, and the national defense strategy has tasked us to do, we're on a, a great path. We have to continue to assess ourselves 
and look at the metrics and yardsticks that the overall Department of Defense uses as they apply to the Army. And we'll continue to provide feedback to not only the Department of Defense, but through our Army and through our capabilities to be ready to assume that mantle and, and field the Army of 2030. Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. General Perkins, sir. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks for making time to uh, to to uh, listen to us talk about what is just absolutely essential. Really, the the whole main reason we're doing this great conference here at AUSA. And I'll I'll just be real quick. So why why 2030? Uh, you know why are we doing Army 2030? And 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 the Dusa mentioned it. So. We've been directed to transform the Army on a sustainable strategic path to an MDO capable Army while maintaining combat credible ready forces every single day in between. So, pretty significant task there if you think about the complexity, right? We don't get a five year break to be unready to spend money on the future, right? We, we got to be ready to fight. See some of our teammates from USRF, uh, Korea. You know, we got teammates from CENTCOM. We're, we're ready to fight right now, and we got to stay that way. And uh, I'll just be honest, there's, we have some challenges. We got things to work on in the Army, but, but fighting is not, is not one of them, in my opinion. So no part of this is because the Army's got issues or isn't ready or is broken. This is about continuing to stay the best arm. So I just want to be clear about that right up front. So sustainable, it's got a fiscal, you know, we, we don't have unlimited resources. So we got to make smart decisions. We got to use our resources that our great taxpayers give us wisely. So we can't go year over year unconstrained by the realities of the fiscal uh, situation that the whole country and department are in. So that creates a, a challenge strategic. We have a new NDS. We have a new national military strategy. Our secretary and our chief have given us strategic guidance. So Army 2030 is the way we've translated that strategic guidance into action. And then a path, uh, there's a famous uh, Sinclair Lewis, I think, you know, if you don't know where you're going, any path will get you there, right? If you've been to Ranger School or if you've commanded a maneuver formation, we always start with actions on the objective. It's like first thing you learn, right? Start with actions on the objective, plan your way back. So the power, and we won't get it 100% correct, but having a 70, 80% idea where you want to be in 2030, modifying that year over year. So sustainable strategic path. Those are, those are three things I'd like to, like to land with, with everybody. Second thing is uh, we care deeply about the M material, right? I don't want to be dismissive of that. We got a bunch of great teammates in academia, industry, lots of partners sharing ideas. We absolutely, if you're a military professional, I think we'd all agree that we have a moral responsibility to make sure the men and women who do the hardest part of what we do have the best possible equipment, right? Absolutely. Uh, and organizations are important, but I, but I want to be clear, Army 2030, at least for the United States Army, is a full DOTMO PFP solution to a complicated problem. And my good friend, General Beagle here, is going to talk about doctrine here in a minute. But it's everything. It's doctrine. It's building the leaders that we need to fight these formations and win. It's our professional military education. Uh, we think in the United States Army that we're pretty good at training, and that's a big part. You know, some people would argue that things like the CTCs had more to do with transforming the Army or as much to do as, as with the, the big five. So full DOTMO PFP, especially the first P, because the Army is people and making sure that the men and women that are our most precious and most valuable asset and our most lethal weapon system always stay at the forefront. So DOTMO PFP. Um, 
and, and we're going to make some hard choices. We're going to have to move some things we have now that we have for good reasons when we were a coin-focused fight. Um, we're going to have to accept some risk and move some of that to Compo 2 and 3 and maybe reduce some of that capability because we absolutely need to add new and additional capabilities. So we got to get back to an air and missile defense to include counter UAS capability. We, we accepted risk. We, we have to put that back into our formations. Long range precision fires are, are one of our premier efforts and we're doing very well on that. But if you look at you, you look at what's going on in Ukraine, conventional cannon artillery matters, right? Rifle squads matter. Tanks and tank platoons and tank companies matter. So we got to sustain some of our stuff, accept some risk, and add new capabilities. And that's all part of Army 2030. Uh, total Army, Compo 1, 2, and 3, right? We got a total Army. It all needs to be on the same direction towards 2030. And what we accept risk and move into Compo 2 or what's better suited for Compo 2 or 3 than Compo 1 is part of this transformation that I'm describing here and we can talk about if anybody would like to. And the last thing I'd like to like to say about Army 2030 is is you know we we have asymmetric advantages against anybody I would offer and the two biggest ones we have are first and foremost our people. The power of an all volunteer force that is well led especially at the commander level so commanders that can do combined arms maneuver uh, better than anybody in the world. So, so that, that's what makes us who we are and what we are. And the second one is maneuver warfare. We're not a, we, we would never enter into an attrition-based fight where we trade our men and women for time, space, or, or terrain, right? We don't do that. We maneuver. We don't uh, we fight ethically. We follow the law of land warfare, so we don't bomb cities and things like that. So uh, that's the last, and I would offer the most important part of Army 2030 is it is it is taking advantage of our asymmetric advantages. Number one, our people. And number two, the way we fight, which is underpinned by by the way we approach training. And. Uh, to your point, sir, I was the G3 a while ago, and we wrote the Army campaign plan, which the chief and the secretary approved, and uh, I tasked myself as the AFC commander, so uh, I tasked a lot of people. Those of you in uniform know that. The bottom line is uh, transforming the Army, modernizing the Army, it's team sport, right? It's team sport. General Brito and I. Great friend, TRADOC, Forcecom has a role. Uh, it's going to take the whole Army. I would offer all of our friends, allies, and partners, the entire joint force are all going to have to come together, probably like we never have. But I'm confident we will and get where we need to be to stay the, the most powerful military and team of teams in the world. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks, sir. Thank you. If, if there was ever a time to feel like a canary in a cat show, now is that time. I've got my boss in front of me taking notes. I've got the person I'm going to support here directly to my right, and then a classmate. And then two of the panel members up here have held my job. So if I have any feathers left, I'll, I'll welcome all questions and feedback. <laughs> But I'll start by saying that if you want to drive change, if you want to lead change, you have to start with doctrine. And you understand where our doctrine comes from. It comes from our concepts. It comes from experimentation at a, at a very rigorous level. And as you've heard, over the past 40 to 50 years, we've had four major operating concepts or capstone concepts for our Army, starting with air land battle to full spectrum operations to unified land operations, and multi-domain being the fourth. And we look at our doctrine as our common body of knowledge. So what I hope to offer to you and share with you is an understanding that puts us on a common sheet of music. Is it perfect? No concept is ever perfect, but it's an evolution of concepts that have came before. That's what multi-domain operations is. So if you were to ask, 
What is multi-domain operations? I'm glad you asked. As defined in our new doctrine, FM3-0, it is the combined arms employment of joint and army capabilities to exploit or to create relative advantages that do three things. They achieve objectives, they defeat enemy forces, or consolidate gains for the joint force commander. That is our common definition. That is the definition that you will find in FM3-0. So if you ask me to expand upon that in terms of how do we leverage multi-domain operations in a large-scale environment, that's part of the problem that multi-domain solves for us. A lot of things to take in consideration for multi-domain operation and as the concept was developed and then experimented on and then turned into to doctrine, it answers a lot of those, those questions. It may not answer everything, but it answers quite a few. One thing that we do have to understand is leveraging multi-domain operations as our approach another term that we use and one that we need our leaders, commanders, and staffs to understand, it is an approach. So understanding that no longer can we operate largely uncontested. The battlefield is transparent. And as you heard this morning from the secretary, the division is the unit of action at the tactical level. Above that level, your corps, your theater armies, they're gonna have to be able to concentrate all the capabilities and effects with our sister services, with our allies and partners all those effects. At the end of the day, it's still a semblance or it still will be combined arms maneuver, combined arms operations, but in a multi-domain environment at large scale. The framework that we use for multi-domain operation, the framework is five domains. And a lot of times we'll get terms confused and mixed, which is why doctrine is our common body of knowledge. But it's those five domains, air, land, maritime, space, and cyberspace. And if you ask what a domain is, is physical. First and foremost, think of those domains as physical. But what do those domains allow leaders and commanders to do? It allows them to see both friendly and enemy capabilities. They understand the domains through the lens of three dimensions, which is also introduced into our doctrine. Those three dimensions, information, human, and physical. So it's through that lens that commanders understand the five domains. And what is what is a dimension? A dimension is how leaders see effects. To leverage an example, if you think about the soldiers of Armenia, when they would hear a drone overhead, it's a cognitive human component or change or advantage that was gained through that lens. So you can see the effects through that lens. They thought to themselves they had seven seconds to survive. Or if you've read some writings, seven seconds to die, just because of hearing or seeing a drone overhead. That's how you leverage a dimension, one of those three dimensions, and seeing across domains, seeing what capabilities you have or your adversary or enemy has. Part of the, the outline of FM30 and the big things that we really need to get our arms around is things that we strive to do. And how have we described that in FM30? We describe them in tenets. Tenets have always been a part of our operating concepts over time. They've changed over time, but they've always been a part of our concepts is what you strive to do in all of your operations. The four tenets are agility, convergence, endurance, and depth. Agility, generally everybody gets their arms around. When you think endurance, think depth, that talks about our protection, our ability to protect ourselves, protect our forces, as well as sustainment. How much depth can we create over time, time, space, and purpose? But it's convergence that gets the most attention. And when you ask, what is convergence? Convergence simply, very simply put, is an outcome. There's a lot of ways we talk about convergence and how to do convergence and how convergence adds up at the end of the day, but convergence is an outcome. Convergence is nothing more and as defined is a concentrated employment of multiple capabilities across multiple domains or echelons against multiple decisive points to create effects. And when I say create effects, you are gonna create those effects either on a system, on a formation, or on a human decision maker or in an area. That is convergence. Convergence is the outcome that you want to achieve. But as I stated, tenets, those four tenets are things that we strive to do. And then there's the must do's. The things that we must do and outline in our doctrine is nine imperatives. A lot of different things, I won't have time to cover it here, but I'll welcome them and welcome those questions about things that we may or may not have covered in the new doctrine 
but imperatives are very important because they're things that you must do, and I'll cover two as examples of the nine. We must account for being under constant enemy observation on a large scale combat, in large scale combat operations in a multi-domain environment and under all forms of enemy contact. We must do that, we must account for it. And that's at echelon. One of the things that we've talked about over many years in the past is always making contact with the smallest element possible. But in the past, that smallest element could be a squad, platoon, or company. Now and going forward, that smallest element could be an unmanned sensor or an unmanned aerial vehicle, making contact at the smallest element possible. So those are the major components of multi-domain operations and things to really understand and get your arms around. And going forward, when we look at the problems, what is the key problem to solve? Is how do we conduct combined arms maneuver and operations in a multi-domain environment at large scale? And that's what our doctrine allows us to be able to do. One thing that we do not need to do is label everything as multi-domain. We do need commanders and leaders to understand the approach and leverage that approach through your training, your leader development, and your education at Echelon so that we all operate off the same common body of knowledge. And at the end of the day, this is what is gonna allow us to teach, train, and educate those leaders that are in our schools now as part of the Combined Arms uh, Center an entire team produce over 300,000 students every single year across the force. But that's the population that is going to inherit the Army of 2030 and the Army of 2040. So with that, I'll pause and welcome any of your questions. I do think I have a few feathers left at the end of this. But thank you, and sir, over to you, Dr. Greer. First, I'd like to thank uh, AUSA for including me in this. Uh, it's a privilege to, to be here. Um, I am from the School of Advanced Military Studies, so there'll be a test after I get done. <laughs> uh, but um, on a personal note, uh, I would like to say that, uh, you know, we aren't what we accomplish. We are what those who follow us accomplish. And uh, the three former students here uh, have obviously accomplished much. Uh, so uh, I'm proud at least uh, to have contributed in a small way to that, but uh, enough of that. Um, as you all know, on the 24th of February, the Russians reinvaded at a larger scale uh, Ukraine. And on the 25th of February, uh, the School of Advanced Military Studies set up a study group uh, to begin to look at uh, this war, look at this large scale invasion. Uh, to see what we could learn from it. And we were focused really in three areas. So the first area was, what does what's going on say about the emerging threats to ourselves and our partners going forward? The second one uh, that we looked at was, what is the change in the character of war? How war is being conducted? Uh, what does what's going on tell us about that? And then the third was, to a certain extent, introspective in terms of what does it tell us about ourselves and where we are and where we need to be going forward? Uh, and so what I'd like to do is share with you uh, some of the results of our ongoing analysis of uh, the campaign in Ukraine and how it informs not just uh, operations in Europe, should it come to that, uh, but more broadly, uh, operations anywhere in the globe should we have to engage in large-scale combat operations. Uh, so the first thing is, large-scale combat operations. As everyone knows, over the last decade, we've been gradually transitioning uh, from the counterinsurgency, counterterrorism in that direction. 2017, we wrote our first truly uh, large-scale combat operations doctrine in quite some time. We've been applying that. Uh, so right now, we're about six years into that. Uh, I would suggest, though, that to a certain extent, we haven't really come to grips with what large-scale combat operations is just because we haven't seen the scope and the scale of large-scale combat operations really uh, since 2003. Um, one of the things that we should remember is that the space in which the Ukrainians and the Russians are currently conducting operations is about 150 times as large as the National Training Center. It's huge. Uh, the distance from Poland 
to the front lines if we had to, to fight is about 1,100 kilometers. Uh, again, that's you know, 50 times the distance that you'd fight at the National Training Center. Uh, so the scope and the scale is extremely large. The forces that are committed in rough order of magnitude are two full cores for us. Uh, so very large formations, uh, very large spaces, and of course everyone's familiar with the, the lethality, the destruction, the consumption of, of materiel, ammunition, etc. cetera, uh, on a scale that we haven't really thought through in a long time. Not that we can't, uh, but we must. The second thing is, even with that large forces and the large space, this is actually a very nonlinear, non-contiguous fight. Uh, the rough battalion frontage uh, for a Russian battalion tactical group is between 10 and 20 kilometers. Uh, that's a, a large space. Uh, and so that means there's big spaces in between. And so in order to be able to cover those spaces in between, you have to figure out how are you going to do that? Uh, as was alluded to, maybe robotics and UASs and things is one way to do that. Uh, other sensors, electronic warfare, et cetera. But you have to have some way to be able to see into all these spaces. And the same is true if you go over to Indo-PACOM. If you're on a bunch of islands, they're all separated by sea. By definition, you are non-contiguous. And so there's a lot that we need to learn about non-contiguous operations within the framework of large-scale combat operations that, uh, that we need to continue to think through and apply. And we're capable of doing that. Uh, the third thing, and again, uh, General Beagle mentioned it, is transparency. The lack of transparency in the battle space because of the pervasive uh, sensors and the inability to completely mask. And that's a two-way sword. I mean, there's advantages for us in being able to ensure that our opponent is not transparent, but there's also risks that are associated with that. One of the interesting things that I think we can learn from what the Ukrainians have done is how to leverage that lack of transparency they've still somehow managed to incorporate deception and economy of force and those operations that uh, are more difficult to do in a non-transparent battle space, but they've still been able to do it, and we can learn from that. Uh, the next thing is uh, the three-dimensionality of the war. Uh, we've had the luxury of being largely two-dimensional for about at least 40 years, if not longer because of the dominance of our air force and our air power over uh, our battle space. We've been able to leverage that on the offensive side through the use of our own uh, attack aviation, uh, support aviation, et cetera. Uh, and we also were able to accept risk on the defense side uh, because of that. That's changed considerably. And one of the things that we can learn from the Ukrainian experience is how do you do air denial using only land forces, and that's something they've been able to achieve. Uh, if we go to Indo-PACOM, uh, because of the space, because of the, the threat, because of the uh, offensive and, and uh, defensive counter-air operations that our air forces and air aviation assets are going to have to do, there may be relatively little air power over our formations, and so we have to be more adept at, at being three-dimensional. Uh, and that's a dot mil PF solution. It's, it's not uh, just a technological solution, but it is to a certain extent a technological solution. And then everyone knows the ubiquity of, a, of UASs. Uh, and so we have to be able to leverage that, leverage our capabilities in that, but also be able to counter our opponent's capabilities in that. Uh, and that is something that scales up uh, to large scale combat operations, even though you're observing the one little UAS that drops a grenade into the hatch of somebody's tank, but that does scale up and it provides both opportunities and challenges for our formations. Uh, CP survivability, uh, something that uh, we've, we've known for a long time that our CPs were too large. Uh, they have a huge signature. They're not very mobile. Um, but we always kind of set it aside and said, okay, we have other things we have to do. Not that uh, we weren't working on it, both technological solutions and doctrinally, uh, but maybe not with the energy that we needed to. Uh, the death of CPs on both sides um, 
in this war, I think, has been a wake-up call for all of us. Uh, and so initiatives, for example, uh, General Taylor and what uh, the National Training Center is doing to present that threat, uh, what uh, the Combined Arms Center is doing to provide the technological solutions, what Forcecom has done to provide guidance uh, for uh, all of our formations to begin moving in the direction of more dispersed, more mobile, more survivable CPs is exactly what we should be doing. Uh, and we need to continue to move in that direction uh, because in the next fight, um, if we are up against whether it's the Russians or the Chinese or somebody else, uh, even if it's a, what formerly we would have thought of as a second or third tier power, our CPs are gonna be at risk uh, and we have to make them more survivable. Reconstitution is absolutely an imperative. It's something that we see both sides doing over and over and over again. Because of the lethality, the destruction, uh, the uh, casualties that everyone's taken, they've had to reconstitute units more than once. Uh, and it's something that uh, we've, we've got to move, move out on. Again, in, in .mo PF, uh, in particular in our training and in our home stations, uh, to think our way through how we're gonna do reconstitution at scale which is another argument for uh, the rebirth of our large formations that we've been engaged in. Because reconstitution has to happen at, at the division, at the core, at the theater army levels, and we have to regenerate those capabilities. Uh, a couple of things that I think um, we're absolutely on the right track and we can leverage because we see the power of it. And the first one is, and, we, and uh, again, General Beagle talked about it, is convergence. We see nascent convergence among the Ukrainians. They took apart the Russian artillery system uh, in part because they were applying convergence. They were applying land power, they were applying electronic warfare, uh, and they were applying air power primarily in the form of, of UASs, uh, but now most recently also uh, with, uh, with fixed wing and attack helicopter. Uh, so they used a, a nascent convergence and we can we can see from that the, the power of where, the direction that we're taking in our doctrine. And that's something I think we have to continue to build on. Combined arms is an obvious one. Uh, again, you see when combined arms is applied effectively, how powerful it is. Uh, and you can see the, when you don't apply it effectively to your own detriment. And that's something we can build on because it's always been a strength. But again, uh, as General Rainey talked about, we've got to up the scale on that so that our combined arms is truly uh, in all five domains. And, and we can do that. Our doctrine uh, is set up to do it. And, and so we just keep, need to keep building on that. The cross-functional teams that we set up uh, about five years ago, they're on the right path. The things that we are developing, again, from our observation at SAMS, uh, is those are the right capabilities. And we just need to, as, as was mentioned, we're starting to get those into the field. We're starting to get those into the formations. Uh, and we need to continue along those paths because we are, in fact, developing the things that we are going to need, the capabilities that we are going to need against this emerging threat and in this uh, changing environment. Not that we have it 100 percent right, but we are absolutely on, on the right path. And then the last thing I, I would say is that uh, we see the power of large formations of divisions and corps. Uh, the Ukrainians call them something else, uh, but that's essentially what they're doing. And there are certain things that only a division, only a core can do. Uh, and those are what the formation brings. Uh, the ability to do a covering force, to keep your opponent at bay so that your main body can move from one place to another and be able to accomplish your purpose. The ability to do counter fire at scale. Uh, only formations can do that. Only large units can do that. And then the whole sustainment piece. Uh, it takes a large formation to be able to do sustainment over months and over large distances and uh, over all the warfighting functions to be able to, to provide that sustainment, to provide that resilience. That can only be done by large formations. Uh, and so we're on the right path there, I believe, and we need to continue uh, to move along that. Again, everything that I said uh, really has come from our students, our majors who are incredibly smart and they are inquisitive and they're looking at this war uh, not from a particular perspective uh, because they're not in 
CAC or they're not in Forcecom or they're not in DevCom, uh, but rather just looking at it almost with a whiteboard and saying, what are we seeing? And what they've seen are these things right here. And I think we can be informed by that uh, as we go forward. Well, <clears throat> thanks to the panel, as you can see, uh, we covered a wide breadth of topics of which there are no simple answers to, but that's because this is an army panel and that's what armies do. They cover a wide breadth of challenges of which there are no simple solutions. That's why we have such great people and great organizations. What we'd like to do now <clears throat> is open up the floor to questions. There are mics on either side of the room. And so if you just queue up, you can either direct it toward any one person or to the panel in general, sir. artillery had spread out further and now we're looking at you know long range precision fires and we're talking about dispersion uh, throughout the death of a theater uh, even dispersion along the LOCs back into the home base in the United States uh, because of that omnipresent surveillance uh, and how does that affect everything it makes command and control harder it makes logistics harder it makes mutual supporting fires harder. It really seems like that's a, that, that basic physical need to disperse and not make a large static target has a huge number of ripple effects across every army function. Yeah, so dispersion is a function of survivability. Any thoughts on that from the panel members? Yeah, sure, I'll take a, a shot at it. Uh, but it's, it's to the points you, you highlighted, and it goes back to those fundamental things that you know we must understand about you know large scale about multi-domain the the fact that the the battlefield is transparent and so we have to be dispersed we have to be you know more agile going back to the tenants but then how do we go from dispersed locations to bring those forces back together you know to achieve decisive effects you know anywhere on the battlefield that we need it mr greer talked dr greer talked about you know contiguous versus non-contiguous so if you're in a theater like indo pacom you're going to be largely non-contiguous, but still at some point you have to converge all those uh, capabilities, you know, concentrate all those capabilities on multiple decisive points, you know, over time. But but it is, it's, it's a reality of the, the current battlefields that we see and the future battlefields that we're going to see, dispersion, you know, is, is critical. Hey, Jim? I would actually say um, one of the advantages we have is actually our experience over the last 20 years. And that is, is that our leaders, both non-commissioned and, and commissioned, have grown up on dispersed battle spaces. Uh, they've grown up separated. And so they have, uh, through their experience, um, the ability to command and control when they are, in fact, separated. Uh, and they have the ability to uh, bring in joint capabilities in support of their operations because it's something that they've done over and over again in multiple tours. I think the challenge for us to a certain extent though is to scale that up. Uh, and so I think that's an area that we need to move into. In a way, uh, many of our uh, leaders are actually more comfortable um, being dispersed than they are when they all can see each other. And, and that's a strength as we go forward. Uh, but we do have to scale it up, uh, I believe. And, and so that's where uh, things like our comms uh, and a lot of our, uh, our coordination, et cetera, come into play. Yeah, I appreciate the question too. And I think what we didn't cover was the defense of the homeland in our discussion of Army 2030. It's a critical component for our national defense strategy and any force that has to fight in 2030 or, be, or beyond, uh, we need to be prepared for 
and very active uh, campaign against the homeland. And for dispersion in, in that sense, it can contribute to uh, our inability to get what we need from our forts and our uh, ports to the battlefields, uh, both in Indo-PACOM or wherever. And I think that uh, we, what we haven't covered was, you know, how do we maintain the ability where dispersion has been, at least in the homeland, a, a strategic uh, a strength for us and to, to maintain that capability and not let the dispersion of, uh, of where we're uh, located across our great country, both uh, you know, from the heartland all the way to the ports, to be able to meet the timeline and the requirements to be able to fight uh, uh, in the theaters where, where we need to mass our formations or, or converge our capabilities. So our dispersion, in some ways, is a challenge that we have to face, not just forward, um, but in the homeland. There, uh, Evan Oxner with Inside Defense, and I think my question's for uh, General Rainey. As you take over uh, AFC, where do you see it fitting into the Army of 2030? I know you're new to the command, but going to 2030 and the, the Army uh, 34 and uh, the 34 modernization priorities, but even beyond that, uh, going into the future, what's AFC's role in uh, delivering those? Yeah, I, I think it'll fit in fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want? Okay. Uh, uh, if, you could, if you could elaborate a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah we I got mean, plenty to do. Hey, I, okay, first of all, it's going to take everybody, right? But uh, a AFC is one of the four major commands in the Army, um, and we work together and we help each other just like we did when we were battalion commanders together in combat. Um, and we have uh, clear guidance from our secretary. We've got oversight from the secretariat. We have acquisition executive, Mr. Bush. Um, so if you think about it simply, um, General Brito at TRADOC is gonna make sure we stay having the best people, best men and women, soldiers, our great non-commissioned officer corps. Uh, leaders, commanders, but he's got a big part of integrating DOTMO PFP for the things that he's the, the proponent, force mod proponent for. General Pappas generates current readiness, make sure that, that we're ready to win a fight anytime. General Daly and his great team at AMC sustain the whole army from making sure the rifle squad gets MREs tonight to the industrial base. And I think uh, AFC is responsible for delivering the Army of 2030. Uh, that's what the Secretary told me to do. You heard her this morning. We're going to design the Army of 2040. But, uh, you know, I, I, one, it would be silly of me to do that in some kind of isolation and not take advantage of all the teammates, not just in the Army. But uh, we got General Flynn and his team doing things out in the Pacific. It's like a virtual experiment and laboratory going on every day. We got a war in Europe going on that we're learning from right now. We got teammates in the homeland. I think somebody said it, you know, anybody who says that some theater is something other than it's a joint coalition fight is I would offer is probably not coming from a, from a point of knowledge at that. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I'm really excited you did. to be Thank the AFC you. commander. Thank you. Hi there. My name's uh, Stephen Matejczak, I'm with Northrop Grumman, and you had mentioned uh, data centricity, and I think specifically uh, logistics, and I would imagine battlefield, are there any other data pools that you're trying to capitalize on? What are they, and is one of them a priority over all the others? I'll take a first shot at it. Um, I think that uh, as we look at our as we build the Army of 2030, we have to be data informed for our recruiting and retention. And we have to be able to go where we haven't gone before in terms of where the people are who we're trying to recruit, where the uh, population densities, where the uh, uh, propensity may not necessarily be there, but it's about being informed about how we can get that data to focus our scarce resources, both in people, and dollars and in uh, advertising and those types of things. And again, it may not necessarily result in a 
warfighting capability immediately, but it is something that we have to focus on. And, and as we look at the analytics of where we're actually putting our resources, who we're actually focusing our attention on, we, we've, uh, we've learned some lessons. And uh, we've, in, we've taken that, uh, that data and, and incorporated into some of our procedures. TRADOC already is, is decreasing the amount of time for some of the procedures that uh, has taken in the past to be able to take a, a citizen uh, into a soldier. And it's been informed by data on where and how we need to improve. So, of course, uh, you know, the people space and, and then the logistics, which, again, uh, I just want to foot stomp. We, we have to be focused on making sure that we lean into uh, the logistics, especially in, into the priority theater. That's where our uh, Department of Defense wants us to be. That's where, as General Rainey talked about, we're doing a significant amount of experimentation and exercising to improve our capacity uh, to uh, withstand the requirements uh, that we know that are going to be levied against uh, our forces uh, if and when we have to uh, fight an Indo-PACOM AOR. So again, we're, we're looking at it comprehensively, our, our, our business uh, uh, systems, uh, everything, uh, and, and we're having you know, the right uh, folks within the Army focus on, on, in on it. So. Go ahead, sir. Thanks. Uh, Patrick Tucker from Defense One. I, I want to go back to something that uh, General McConville said at the top. Uh, and he said that the events in Ukraine are already forcing uh, some changes and some reconsiderations in terms of doctrine. So uh, a lot of the things that we're talking about here, the um, modernization priorities existed before February of 2022. Uh, some of those TRADAC changes uh, existed before February of 2022. Uh, can you speak to what in your previous path has changed as a result of what you see coming out of the European theater? Where did you move or alter the path that you were on, uh, either in terms of acquisition, in terms of AFC, in terms of doctrine, anything? Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. I was just going to speak real quick on the doctrine piece. And I think one, one of the things you know, to highlight in the doctrine is, is through it, we did not discount you know, the last two decades plus of war. But what was incorporated into the current you know, doctrine is those things being learned from Nagorno-Karabakh, from the Ukraine since 2014, not just you know, as, of, as of late, but since that time. And that's what you know, got us to, you know, how do you change the tenets? What are the things that we must you know, consider in terms of imperatives? So things that you know, Dr. Greer you know, mentioned as well, the transparency of the battlefield, the, the understanding that you know, how do we make contact at the smallest element possible? How do we sense and see for ourselves? I mean, so those things from a doctrinal perspective conceptually as a capstone concept or things that have that have changed based on what we've learned you know recently yeah that's a great question I, and I don't want to speak for the chief um, you, you know we have 300 or so doctrinal manuals it's a it's a suite of doctrine we have several that were this close to coming out on the on the heels of, of 3 I don't want to get in general Brito's uh, business but I w was the g3 a little while ago and we've we've taken a pause X on some of that to understand uh, the what we're learning about the information dimension in in this fight but uh, uh, there we looked at Nagoro Karabakh the um, the war in, in Ukraine has been going on since 14 I, I I think the army did a commendable job of doing the next generation warfare study led by TRADOC um, so we're learning from that the requirements iterations you know we don't we, th those are informed by a bunch of things so we're going back and and looking at things we're you know i i personally hesitate to say learning i think we're observing things in a very complex situation that that has potentially uh you know a long way to go but as we pick those observations our systems are agile enough both on the material side the doctrine side uh, again, not not speaking for bigs, but but leader development is pretty agile. The ability to inject things into professional military education. So that, I think the chief's point was probably that that we're not just driving on without paying attention to what is a really fascinating and complex uh, fight going on right now. 
and really applies all over. We're learning things from CENCOM, AOR. We're learning from the Pacific every day, working with partners and allies. Colonel Jennifer Nolan, U.S. Army Reserve. Uh, sir, I think this is for General Rainey, sir. Uh, you talked about balancing the total Army to ensure Compo 1 has the room to modernize for 2030. Since Compos 2 and 3 are still structured based on the 1993 offsite agreement, do you think it's time to get the band back together and have a 2023 offsite to ensure Compos 2 and 3 have the correct talent and capabilities necessary to support the active component? Well, more importantly than what I think, the Secretary of the Army absolutely thinks so. And she directed uh, the G357 uh, to use the next total Army analysis process, which I can talk to you offline. It would be wasting everybody's time to try and explain it. But the process by which we fundamentally adjust the Army She's issued guidance that the next time through that, we're gonna look at total Army. And it's not, uh, I'll be clear, I'm, I might have misunderstood you. We're not doing things to Compo 2 and 3 so we can do what we want to Compo 1. I know you didn't mean that, but just, just to be clear, right? There are capabilities in Compo 2, in Compo 3 that we think we are gonna need fast in a fight. And it's all about balancing risk. And we made good decisions for 20 years, right? Um, and we might have put things in Compo 1 because of the pace by which our op tempo drove us, that we might be able to accept more risk and move them later into Compo 2 and 3, where you can leverage uh, the deep, you know, the thing, there's, there's expertise you can get at in Compo 2 and 3, right? Doctors that are real doctors all day and then also can, can deploy, right? So thank you, that was a great question. But stick around for next year, I'll have a better answer for you. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, Major Hirschkorn here. I'm a planner at 3, three Armored Corps. I had a general question about the uh, division as a unit of employment. I offer it to the panel for your thoughts. Um, it goes like this. Um, so, so much of the Army's uh, machinery and muscle memory, I'd, I'd argue, seems focused on brigades uh, as, a, you know, as the audience for training and employment, both at the CTCs um, and then in, uh, for force requests for the joint, uh, for our combatant commands. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how, what changes might be needed for changing the focus to divisions being the, uh, excuse me, uh, the units of employment. Thank you. Let me start on that one and I'll get, get, give it over. Um, yeah, that, that's a great question. And there'll be, there'll be critics that'll say, well, you know, you're, you're going backwards to go to a division. And that is absolutely not the case. Okay, first of all, everything we're doing is threat informed uh, Lieutenant General Potter, our G2, the entire enterprise of Intel is where everything starts threat informed. Um, so if you look at, and then experiments and analysis and everything else, if you look at the, and we've been talking around it, somebody had a great question about uh, complexity. The, the large scale combat ops against a peer threat the amount of complexity, speed, violence, chaos leads us to the conclusion that our great brigade combat team commanders are going to be wholly consumed winning the fight they're in, right? You're not going to be able to sit still and plan two days later, right? You're not going to be able to be in a close fight trying to get across a river, trying to, trying to do a defile drill somewhere, getting in an urban fight and be worried about shaping your next fight. Uh, you're absolutely going to have to have access to a common operating picture and intelligence, but somebody's got to give it to you because you're not going to be able to have server stacks surrounded by concertina wire and the 300 people that go with them, right? So the complexity, speed, violence, really the horror of war, if you think about it, 
our brigade commanders will win the fight they're in with their teams, but, but the rest is going to have to come. They're going to have to get push logistics at the right time in a predictive nature. So it is first and foremost about the complexity of a future fight. The second thing is shift weight, designate the main effort, right? The way you fought. When we built BCTs, we pushed all of our enablers into our brigade combat teams, which made all the sense in the world if you're doing R4 gen for coin fights where we're asking a brigade commander to lock down, you know, a third of Iraq and handle it for a year. Complex, absolutely, really complex, but you're not a maneuver formation. So we got up to seven battalions and, you know, 40, 42, 4,300 people. So what we need now is our division commanders who can fight really well to have those capabilities to make sure the brigade commander who needs it when he or she needs it has the fires, right? Massing artillery, making, we're never gonna have enough protection assets. They better be at the right place at the right time. Um, so that's another reason why coming up, coming up to division uh, works. And then the last thing, if you look at the size of the army, uh, not all, not everybody's going to go, right? It, it, the speed contested trying to get out of a homeland. So if we put 58 artillery brigades or battalions in 58 brigades, some of them are going to get left. I would argue that if you have a, a, a well-trained, cohesive division artillery, core artillery, separate artillery brigades, they're probably all going to go. We'll see how many armored and light brigades go, but all of our fires, all of our air defense, all of our information and cyber capability. So those are good reasons. I'll tell you a couple more because I said, just what I said, asymmetric, right? Asymmetric advantages, people and training. Um, the span of control of these Army 2030 formations is going to go down, and, and that's a good thing, right? I mean, it, th there are a lot of reasons to get the leader-to-lead ratio down inside our formations and let our leaders make sure they deliver the, the quality of leadership they need. And then from a training, TRA, and I, listen, I commanded a new, I mean, I commanded a brigade. I thought I could do everything, I, and I, I obviously couldn't. But the best person to train artillery people is the senior artillery person in a formation. The best logistician in a formation is probably not the infantry or armor brigade com combat team commander. Hopefully they're good at it. The intel enterprise, you know, that you have it at G2, right? So, so three good war fighting reasons a better leader to lead ratio and I would offer and I, some people disagree with me but I, I believe a better training approach is why we're doing that our BCTs are, are gonna get they're, they're still gonna be the decisive you know they're still gonna have to fight right it's not like we're gonna fight with a with a, you know a staff somewhere but they're gonna they got to get smaller because they got to survive they got to get smaller because we need to improve their tactical and strategic mobility we got to get way more protection in there, and we got to be able to do more killing with smaller formations than we can do now, which I believe are, are you know, if you look at the technological advances coming, I, I, I think we're going to be able to put more lethality in a smaller formation, but it's going to take a lot of hard work and partnership. But that, that would be my answer. I wish I was good enough to have planted that question with you, but thank you for that. <laughs> thank you, sir. Hey, Jared, don't walk away. Um, I just want to add a, a couple things. Um, I think it's important that we think of the division not, uh, at, when you talk about it as a UE, not uh, just for an engagement or just a battle. Uh, but if we learn anything from this ongoing war, uh, it's the requirement for duration and endurance. And, and again, large formations, divisions, and corps are the only things that can provide that. So it's not just shaping the conditions so that the BCT can win this fight. It's keeping the BCT in the fight over weeks and over months. Uh, and I think that's where we have to focus our divisions and cores is in that duration and in that endurance. Um, you know, war is not going to be a two-week-long warfighter. 
uh, it's going to be much more than that. We have to we have to focus on that, um, and and so that's that's the other area that I think is extremely important. And as a core, uh, you know, asking yourselves as a core, how do we keep those divisions in the fight over time? Uh, and I think that's going to be extremely important. So. Yeah, and not not to beat a dead horse because we're gonna we're gonna turn this thing into glue in a second. But when you look at you know the concept, I mean the, the fundamental aspect about multi-domain operation is at large scale. That that's the the bottom line premise to it. If you compare that to previous concepts, i.e., full spectrum operations, that's all focused around low intensity. We knew we we're going to be doing low intensity, but looking forward, it is about large scale. So it's not that you know we're confused. It's large scale is what we're seeing now and what we see in the future. And then when you look at the two party theaters, especially in Paycom. It's, it's large scale. We we can scale down, um, you know, in a sense. But but that's the focus, you know, of the doctrine. And then when you talk about or think about convergence, it is that you know concentrated employment, you know, across multiple domains, you know, with our allies, with our partners. As General Rainey said, that's going to be overwhelming for a brigade or a BCT. And as the secretary pointed out this morning, it is you know adding structure, adding personnel to division and higher so that they they can do that effectively. To concentrate those capabilities, you know, across multiple echelons, at multiple across multiple decisive points, that's what you need those higher echelons uh, to do. Versus, you know, at the brigade level, is all about winning that close fight. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Lieutenant Colonel Josh Arbo from the United States Army Reserve. Uh, Appreciate the opportunity to ask questions. I know I had Dr. Greer when I was in the SAMS a few years ago as well. So it's good to see that there's potentially hope in the future. You can just keep working your way up. So keep rowing. <laughs> keep rowing. Uh, so with that being said, as we've talked through this, listening to General Perkins and listening to Undersecretary uh, Secretary Diaz, we see the character wars evolving, speed and complexity. It's much faster. It's going to require those joint multi-domain operations, which leads to me just from experience at USERPAC and other locations is just, it's going to require us to think about how we educate leaders. And so really just thinking of Dr. Greer and then thinking to uh, Lieutenant General Beagle, as you take on your role as a combined arms center commander is, is how are we going to make our joint or our professional military, sorry, professional military education more joint, to make it inherently joint, to educate future leaders that can think 3D uh, just building off the experience of Unified Pacific and some of these other war games the Army's done, like we have to be able to teach our leaders to think three-dimensionally for these complex problems. So just kind of what are your thoughts on the future and how does the Army lead the way for joint professional military education? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and from the perspective of CAC, you know, we can't, we can't do it alone. I mean, it has to be done at Echelon, but it goes back to the, the base point of everybody has to understand the approach. We, ha we all have to understand our doctrine and even the down trace doctrine that will come out of, you know, 3-0, as General Rainey, you know, alluded to, some has been put on pause. And once we get all that online, across our echelons and formations, we, we all have to, one, understand it. I mean, using that common body of knowledge. But if you look at how our PME is designed to include our, you know, our Army civilian professionals, the, um, the other services, allies and partners that are, that are part of the course that are, you know, here in the room that go through PME with us is learning from them. The lessons learned that come out of our you know, call centers, come out of our CTC rotations, come out of our experiments that we do, all has to be integrated in, but we must do that at Echelon. So the leader development down at the lowest levels, if it's not incorporating our doctrine, the lessons learned, and we're not talking about it there, then, then we're not gonna do ourselves any good. Uh, we have to do it, I, I would say, across all of our Echelons to ensure that we're, we're factoring in the lessons learned, to ensure that we're factoring in things that are coming out of experimentation than other things that we're doing across our force and as well as the joint force as well. And I would say, again, as we get terms proper, you know, joint operations are all domain. Army operations are multi-domain, right? Um, not to correct you on terms, but, um, but again, we have to understand fundamental points, you know, just like that so we all stay on the same sheet of music so we truly know what we mean and how we need to train and educate and do our, and conduct our leader development. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Okay, any, okay, Sydney, go ahead. <laughs> I'll, I'll never stop, but yeah, I'll keep on coming. Uh, 
across all these different priorities, we have, you know, this is not a material panel, but you know, we have our 35 priorities of which I think a couple of dozen are coming online in one form or another. Um, looking at the threads you guys have talked about, uh, about dispersion, about tempo, about uh, command and control, about uh, shifting functions up uh, the echelons to division and core, is there a crucial enabling function or connective tissue among those 35 P materiel programs? I know they're not designed to be interlocking, they're designed to be independent, so we don't pull one block out and topple the whole Jenga tower like with FCS. But is there some, you know, materiel priority that, you know, is absolutely foremost in your minds to enable all the things that you are talking about today? Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, team. The, uh, one, humans, right? I don't, I don't mean to be flippant, but, but uh, you know, the war is a contest of will between human beings and, and having, having the best people, best soldiers, best non-commissioned officer corps, best leaders at scale, and best commanders. Um, so I, I, I will do everything I can to make sure that everything we're doing, we never lose sight of that, getting back to that teamwork. Um, and we have a smaller part of that. We ought to, we ought to be able to we ought to be able to tell TRADOC what kind of leader attributes and leader skills and things. We ought to be able to write requirements, documents that, that include human things so that they can bring the power of their enterprise to bear in support. But I know you're not gonna let me get away from that unless General Perkins. Um, if I had to, uh, again, been been the commander all week and I'm gonna go through a very deliberate phase, but I think our modernization priorities are right. War is not a simple thing. It, it's, it's hard to put your finger on one thing. Um, I'm, I'm almost certain that, that, uh, that we got to have a, a joint network at speed and scale that's compatible with our partners across the joint force um, that kind of makes it really hard to do any of the other things we visualize if we don't bring that to bear. But even that, you know, I mean, if, if nobody can talk, the American Army at least, we're not going to quit, right? I mean, somebody will walk until they make contact and, you know, somebody will close with and destroy the enemy. So I don't think there's a single thing, but uh, the network would be close. We, we believe that everything you do is driven by intel, right? So we've got to be able to sense in a way that lets us offensive and defensively fight. Uh, so those would be a couple, but again, uh, I'll have it figured out by the panel on Wednesday. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just kidding. Don't ask me that on Wednesday. <laughs> Go ahead. Sir, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Jan Indertveld, Royal Netherlands Army. Um, as, a, as a recent SAMS grad, I can att and having suffered Dr. Greer's extensive testing as well, <laughs> I, can, uh, I can attest to the excellent learning, and, uh, learning environment of, uh, of SAMS. Uh, and that is, in my opinion, uh, also to do, uh, uh, also because of the fact that SAMS incorporates multinational uh, uh, learning environments. So for every eight Americans, I believe there's one international student. And my question uh, relates to that point. Uh, and this is for uh, General Rainey, if you, uh, if you will, sir. How do you, um, what role do you see for the innovative potential of uh, relatively smaller nations, armies, in uh, preparing the U.S. Army for tomorrow's fight? Well, it's going to take all of us, and I think everybody has strengths and everybody has gaps and everybody has things that, that they're very good at. Uh, so I, I think that I, I'm not. Are you saying like in, innovating in lieu of other things, or the fact that some countries have more of an innovative culture? Or, or I, for, for example, uh, Project Convergence, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, to take that as as an example, uh, it is yeah. now not. Very, uh, not many nations are involved as uh, in, in doing the, the actual project itself. Yeah. Um, how do you see that going on? Uh, yeah, more, more and more over time, more and more collaborative, more 
you know, it's, it's, it's not, not uh, intentionally structured in a way to preclude our allies and partners. We're just getting started figuring some things out. But uh, the chief and the secretary's intent is to, to be, you know, increase the scale, increase the inclusiveness, and certainly our, our partners and allies will be included more and more as we move through it. Thanks, sir. I think it's also important to continue to have our allies be part of our organizations uh, at Echelon. I had the luxury of working with uh, General uh, Michel Henri St. Louis from the Canadian Army uh, when I was at First Corps. And although the Canadian Army didn't, doesn't possess the capabilities for scope and scale, his presence, his uh, ability to uh, help us think differently, um, not only when we train, but when we conducted exercises, especially in the Indo-PACOM AOR, was very powerful. So it, we, we don't own any patent of innovation and, and our allies and partners, especially in Indo-PACOM, but as Kevin Marcus can allude to in, in Europe today, are providing us with an unbelievable capability that uh, is, is critical in the 21st century. And it's in, even though Project Convergence uh, may not have the necessary participation that we'd like, the participation in the joint uh, and combined board of, directors, board of directors is increasing. And as we continue to develop and, and, and gain capability, as we go forward with uh, uh, things like AUKUS, um, we, will, we will have increased participation and our allies and partners will be critical. So uh, I, I think that outsized participation at those headquarters makes a difference. Uh, gentlemen, Mr. Chris De La Rosa, U.S. Army North. Uh, with uh, statements of need for large formations with emerging capabilities to campaign, do we need to adjust our core and division structure forward to support campaigning, especially in this time of contested environment? I'm going to show a little bit of bias of my previous time in uniform at First Corps and the 25th Infantry Division. And uh, I would just say that if we look at where we are now in Europe with Fifth Corps forward, and imagine if we didn't have that capability and capacity forward, where we'd be now. So yes, it does require a lot of uh, uh, things that we have to look at in terms of potential forward uh, focus uh, for, uh, in this case, First Corps. Um, but I do think that there are some strong benefits to that. We have to work it through our systems in Title 10, work it through uh, the Office of the Secretary of Defense for posture and other types of activities, so not getting in front of them at all. But I do think that that discussion probably needs to be had, especially when you're talking about timing. We, we preposition stocks and equipment, our headquarters presence and our ability to uh, plan and coordinate and then be in theater campaigning is a critical uh, capability that we've definitely learned. So um, without making any promises or signing us up to anything, I do think that that's something that uh, we're going to continue to look at as we go forward. And the Army of 2030, uh, especially uh, Indo-PACOM, um, we're, we're going to continue to look at, um, at how and, and where it campaigns. Look forward to the fifth core lessons learned in, over the next couple of days as well. Thank you. Gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, Heath Dunbar, U.S. Army, retired. Mr. Undersecretary, uh, you just mentioned your experience in first course. I think you'd be the best uh, person maybe to address this first off. But uh, my, my question concerns logistics in the, uh, the, the, the prior theater of priority, Indo-PACOM. Uh, where do we see the major capability gaps uh, in that theater now? And what are we doing between now and 2030 from either a material perspective or, or somewhere else on the DOTMO PF spectrum? And also, I have to think that part of the solution is a joint solution. So can you address what we're doing to try and uh, uh, bring more capability to that uh, AOR between now and 2030? Absolutely. I, it definitely is a joint solution. I do think that uh, watercraft is, uh, is uh, an area that we were um, going to invest to ensure that we have the capability 
uh, in a distributed um, in a, a, a very non-contiguous environment to be able to rapidly su supply and resupply uh, as required. Uh, with our A Theater Sustainment Command, uh, which is a definite uh, strength to uh, our, our forward positioning, but there may be some increased uh, capabilities that uh, we can have to make it truly a joint logistics command. Um, as mentioned, uh, the Army provides headquarters at Echelon uh, and, and a backbone of decision making and planning. And I think uh, within uh, the Priority Theater, the 8th uh, Theater Sustainment Command is doing great. And if we want to really get after the concept of uh, contested logistics, uh, we, we really need to see how in the next couple of years through our experimentation and maybe different ways of increasing uh, uh, limited capacity within that headquarters we can do so. And I think we have that as an objective for Talisman Sabre 23 and we're going to uh, push the envelope there to see where we uh, exactly need some additional types of capability. So I'll, I'll just focus on those particular areas but uh, you know it's, it's going to be something that we're going to rely on the joint force to also uh, continue to help us work through that because in that particular uh, theater we have to uh, build and maintain the trust uh, within the joint force that uh, that the army logistics forces are going to be there when needed and i think that we're there now we're just going to continue to increase that uh, capacity Thank you. well i think that was the official last question since uh, there's a lot of demands on our folks up here uh, let's have another round of our applause uh, for our panel members up here. Uh, those of you who still have questions, some of them may hang around later here on the sides and, and follow up on that. And as the Secretary said, we're becoming a data-centric army. So with that in mind, there's a QR code on the back wall there that if you take a look at that, it'll give you more information, including an info paper on Army 2030. So again, thanks to our panel and thanks for you all spending time with us today. Have a great day.